Welcome to choosing prior parameters for the beta distribution. Okay, we've been talking about this Bernoulli experiment for a while now, and we've found that the beta distribution seems to work well with this particular type of data, where Bernoulli is 0, 1 data with a probability of success or probability of 1 equal to P. Um, we did this in several videos, so you might want to run back and look at those. Um, the key is, is if we choose a beta distribution as our prior distribution, Distribution, then our posterior distribution comes out as a beta, which means it's a conjugate distribution, which we'll talk about later as well. And here it is for just if we're interested in a beta uh, or Bernoulli trials here. Okay, and it gives us a beta distribution. The question is, is how do I choose those alpha and beta for my prior distribution? And I'll give you a couple examples here. Okay, so um, we could choose uniform. Uniform means every point is equally likely. Uh, we could look at the number of successes and failures approach, and we could look at the method of moments approach. There's lots of approaches, but I'm trying to keep this down to something reasonable. Okay, so Eshal is interested in the proportion of museum goers who would be willing to pay for membership. Since she doesn't have any previous information to go on, she would say that any value for the proportion P is equally likely. Okay, so that would be uniform. We have no information. Well, that seems reasonable. It's between zero and one. Every point's equally likely. Why not? Um, and just keep in mind, this doesn't mean there's no information in this distribution. There is information. The fact that the data or the proportion is going to be between zero and one, that is information. All right, so if she uses this, uh, and then she goes and collects some data, so she collects a survey of 52 museum goers and finds that 32 would be willing to pay for membership, then we can use the formula that we had at the beginning for the posterior. Okay, so if we had the probability of 4p, the proportion, given the data is alpha plus the sum of the xi, beta plus n minus the sum of the xi. Well, beta or alpha is 1, beta is 1, uh, 32 is the sum of the xi, they're telling you this directly, so you don't even have to add it up, and 52 is the total. Uh, which is n, so we just plug all these in, and we end up with a beta 3321. Pretty easy. Okay, and this gives a 95% credible interval if we use q beta and r of 0. 0.4789 to 0. 0.7354. All right, let's look at a different approach. Um, if I stare at this formula, you know what? Right here, we're always adding in the number of successes. So alpha is getting added to the number of successes, and n minus the xi is the number of failures, and beta is getting added to that. So we could think about specifying alpha and beta in terms of successes and failures. Uh, so if we did that, that makes it easier to come up with an idea of how to do this. And let's look at an example. So, uh, Jamila is interested in the proportion of catalpa worms that are infested with wasp eggs. Uh, given uh, how many catalpa worms she sees on a catalpa tree, she thinks maybe 2 in 20 worms are probably infected. So here, she's telling you there's two successes out of 20 trials. So that would mean 18 failures. So we could specify alpha equal to 2, beta equal to 18. And that would incorporate this information into our prior distribution. And then she can go off and collect some data. So she goes to the field, collects 186 catalpa worms, and finds that 63 are infested with wasp eggs. So put this information into our pro posterior distribution that we have our data. Uh, alpha is 2, the sum of the xi is 63, 18 was our beta, n is 186, and 63 again is the sum of the xi, uh, which is the sum of the successes, is 63. So that leaves us with a beta 65, 141. And if we did a credible interval on that, we could see that using Q beta and R, we end up with 0 0.2540 and 0 0.380 is our credible interval now that we have this information. And it combines both the prior information and the information from the data together into this interval. All right. So those two seem pretty easy. Now let's go to one that's a little more involved. 
So we can use this idea of method of moments, okay? Method of moments will allow us to incorporate variation into this. The other one, we were just kind of shooting from the hip. Uniform, really picking nothing. It's just, yeah, that's a default. Um, and then you could always, you know, use the success failure method. But this method is far more mathematical in terms of calculation wise. So here we can get the moments from the data uh, if we can get it. But remember, we don't have the data yet. So we'll have to find a way to get this information out of what we're given. But these are the moments and we can then uh, find them, uh, find our information and find alpha and beta from there. So we have two equations, two unknowns, and I'm going to say that's too much algebra for here. Okay, so here's the answer. So if you solve these things backwards uh, for what you have for alpha and beta, this is the formulas you get. Now, key to notice that this number here and this number here are identical. So when you go and calculate this, calculate this, and then you've done it for both, and then this becomes easy. All right, so we just need a way to come up with these two quantities. And they're not that hard. They're just a little tedious. So uh, Maha is interested in the proportion of people who intend to give charity next month. So she believes between 2 and 10% intend to give some form of charity in the next month. So you could think of this as being sort of like a confidence interval. So if we tear this apart like sort of a frequentist confidence interval, we can pull the information out. So um, if here's our formula for the frequentist confidence interval, and we're just using this to pull the information. We're not going to use this to make an interval. Okay, so what's our guess at p hat? Well, how about halfway through the interval? That sounds reasonable because we're adding in plus and minus here, so we're adding and subtracting the same amount, so the middle should be p hat and that comes out at 0 0.06 for this particular interval uh, you just take 0.1 and add to it 0 0.02 divide that by two bingo you get the midpoint of the interval okay now take the second part of the uh formula this is the width of the interval right well it's a half width really um so what we'd want to do is we'd want to take the width of the interval and divide it by two and that will tell us what w is and we can solve this backwards so that is the upper number 10 percent minus the two percent divided by two boy that formula is very similar to what we used before when it was plus but now we end up with 0 0.04 Okay, we plug this in. Our Z value usually for a 95% confidence interval is 1.96. And the variance is this piece here. So I just solve this and get the variance of X. All right, so once I solve it, you can see here that I get uh, 0 0.04 over 1.96 quantity squared, which is approximately 0 0.0004. Whew, that could be a little bit of work to do. But it's really not that hard. You just have to think through it. So we have an expected value, and we have a variance now. So let's see what that comes out with. Okay, so we have our information. Now we use the other two formulas, because now you feel like you're done. I've got two answers. I should be done. Nope, you're not done until you get alpha and beta. All right, so here's our formulas again. So what we're going to do is just plug everything in. 0 0.06 here, at every place there's an expected expected value of x and 0 0.0004 for the variance of x so that's what i did here uh calculate this bit first and you get 140 and then you multiply this out and you end up with 8.4 and 131.6 these don't have to be whole numbers though so if you end up with things that are not whole numbers don't worry don't round anything off just leave it the way it is uh, we might want to see how we did with this, though. Do we end up getting back what we tried to get back? Um, so if we did this, and I check it in R, I just use Q beta again. Here's my, uh, get my quantiles that I want for 8.4 and 131.6. And I end up with 0 0.027. And here I end up with 0 0.104. So that's pretty close to 2% and 10%. Uh, so that means that this is not at all an unreasonable prior uh, distribution that reflects the 2% and 10% information. And that's why I'm showing it to you, because it's a, it's a mechanism to incorporate information depending on how they give you the information. All right, so she goes out. You're going to use this prior distribution, surveys, surveys 132 people, and finds that 18 plan on giving charity in the next month. 
So go back to our formula that we've been using, plug in the alpha of 8.4, plug in the sum of the xi, which is 18, uh, beta was 131.6, n was 132, minus our 18, we end up with a beta of 26.4, 245.6. Okay, if you go and put this into a credible interval using Q beta, you'll end up with 0 0.0648 and 0 0.1348. Hey, we were able to see how much this changes and notice that it was different than 2% and 10%. It's really between 6% and 13% uh, now that we've seen the data. Okay, so that was a lot for one video, but here's the idea. We could use uniform, we could use successes and failures, we could use method of moments, which is a little bit tedious, but it gets us really close to a good answer, or I mean a good prior distribution. Uh, there's lots of other methods that I'm not talking about because I'm shooting just to get alpha and beta if they were prior uh, distribution because it's nice and conjugate. Just because it's challenging, don't just simply default to uniform because you know, successes and failures is pretty easy. And method of moments, once you get used to it, is not that hard. But we're going to start looking at some other distributions that are built off Bernoulli trials, and we'll start in the next video. So see you there.